Barcelona és una ciutat amb molta història. Una ciutat que ha crescut fins on ha pogut, ja que està limitada per una muntanya, un mar i dos rius. L'espai per viure s'ha convertit en un bé preuat i hi ha qui ho ha aprofitat per fer negoci. En aquest escenari tan complicat també hi neixen les idees més esperançadores per aconseguir que l'habitatge sigui un dret real. Les vols venir a conèixer? How is everybody doing? I hope you've enjoyed today's workshops and also yesterday's field trips and the dinner. And now let's keep on with the discussion. The last plenary session was focused in rent control, its scope and consequences. And this plenary session goes even further since it's titled New Urban Challenge, How Tourism and Gentrification Are Changing Cities. And the truth is that I was going to say something else, but yesterday, as I was walking in my neighborhood, I saw this, these images that our colleagues will share. And I thought that this was the best way to start this session because they represent this problem in so many places in our cities. So let's see what our speakers have to say about that because this plenary will be devoted to the discussion of the consequences of tourism and the models or measures that we have to manage such a pressure. In order to do so, we will count on Agustin Cocola Gan, Mary Curie researcher at the School of Geography of the University of Leeds and researcher at the Center of Geographical Studies of the University of Lisbon. Also, Dimitris Petas, Mary Curie researcher at University of Berlin and PhD in Urban Geography from the Athens School of Architecture. Nancy Holman as well, who is Associate Professor of Urban Planning at the London School of Economics. She's a planner by training and she also has a PhD in Urban Policy. And the session will be moderated by Monse Pareja Istaway, who all of you know, of course. So now you can join us on stage and let's receive them with a round of applause, please. So, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I know that it's the last day, and the last day is always the most difficult to get people <laughs> attending the plenaries. Um, well, yes, Nuria already introduced the topic. Uh, this, uh, this plenary, which is called the New Urban Challenge, How Tourism and Gentrification Are Changing Cities, or the so-called the gentrification plenary. Uh, uh, I mean, I think that we are just privileged to have three people that are experts on the topic, that they have thought a lot about what's going on in many European and non-European cities. And I don't want to use much time uh, because we are a little bit uh, on a schedule, let's say that. So I would like to invite Agustin to start, to start with her, his presentation. So Agustin, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, hello. Is the presentation working? Uh, wait, wait, wait before the presentation. Wait until it is here. Okay. Okay. No, so easy. thank you, thank you for this invitation, Montserrat. It's a pleasure to be here. And actually, if uh, <laughs> just answering to Nuria, if tourists go home, maybe we all should leave uh, this uh, this room. Uh, so basically, I think I think uh, the situation is much uh, complicated, and I prefer to to talk about uh, tourism uh, mobilities, uh, the hospitality, and how. Uh, hospitality and real estate is converging into new real estate uh, products, also helped by new uh, technologies. Uh, this is going to be my presentation today. I think the picture of Airbnb is much more complicated. It's not Airbnb connecting uh, uh, homes, hosts with guests. 
this model, I think it doesn't exist actually, and, and I will try to provide evidence of how the market is supplied. Just to say a bit about my, my, and me, about my positionality. So I was a resident in Barcelona for many years, and in 2002, 2003, we started seeing how residents in the city center of Barcelona started complaining against uh, tourist apartments. Uh, even before Airbnb that was created in 2008. So that social movement uh, got some momentum, and in 2005, the city council created the first uh, regula regulation system, like a register. So they started to provide them licenses uh, to tourist apartments. That was before Airbnb. And then something, another anecdote is very interesting because in 2011, you know how the Indignados movement in Spain uh, so occupied the squares, and, and in that context, uh, a lot of uh, community assemblies were created in the squares of the neighborhoods, and in the city center, the main concern were tourist apartments, and that was before the success of global success of Airbnb. Uh, and that, at that point, so we created some uh, stickers uh, marking tourist apartments with the, with the message, housing for people, not for tourists. So you already know about my positionality uh, about this, and I don't want to ask you how many of you stayed in Airbnbs in this conference, but that is, anyway, don't worry. Uh, so this, uh, this picture that I show you here is about a, a co-living space in Lisbon called Selina. Uh, Selina, Selina Group, this for space for digital nomads, kind of luxury or upper class international students. They have co-working, specialty coffee shop, a swimming pool, etc. 3,000 per month uh, is, the, is the rent here for these people. But, the, but these people have been funded by institutional investors uh, with 400,000 million uh, dollars to open Selinas in 18 countries. So all this to say that the Temporary rental market, the short-term rental market is very complex. There are different products, different lot of uh, lengths of stays, different customers, or converging in tourist cities. Um, another, I don't know where to point here. Another anecdote, another story, short, small story that I wanted to tell you is uh, how massive institutional investors are buying apartments to rent on the short-term rental market. Uh, the, the CEO of RDNA said the business model has been proven and now the opportunity is to do this at a scale. So I think we, we, the beginning of the Airbnb market was like an informal accommodation, individual homeowners renting, but now we are in a different phase which is a completely professionalized market and that professionalized market is attracting institutional investors. And my present, in my presentation I, I want to uh, explore how this market works, the supply structure of this, of this market. And also here, this also the, the second, the news on the bottom, that was last week. So basically these institutional investors are waiting housing prices to go down because of the recession that apparently we will have in the autumn and winter. So they, they want to buy cheap to convert housing into short-term rentals. So, so all this to say that uh, after the boom of Airbnb that we have seen in the last decade, I think that we are at the beginning of something even bigger. And so uh, regulations and how to control this and, and is very important, and also to know how it's uh, working. And this is the aim of my presentation today. So the supply structure of the industry, how they rely on technology, and also the expected demand, why this market will grow even more in the future. Um, here, okay. So this scheme, this, this structure of the market, it, it doesn't work, maybe it worked in the past, but this changes as the market professionalizes. And for me, uh, this, is, this is a very interesting data from a paper that is coming from Consoy and, and, and Julian Short. This is, this is showing uh, I, I don't know, the laser is not working apparently. Ah, it's not working. Okay, on the, on the top right, you have listings, number of listings. And you see that the bigger number of listings is very casual or casual listings. 
But at the bottom, you have revenues. And the casual listing and very casual listing, the revenues are very, basically very marginal. So the, the home sharers or, or the people that occasionally list their homes is very marginal in, in terms of uh, revenues in this business. And so all the profits, which is the, on the right column, all the profits are making but very frequently rented apartments. So the full, uh, the, all the supply, which is all the time available on Airbnb. So obviously the, the rhetoric of the sharing economy is just a marketing strategy, and Airbnb knows that the business is there, is in the professional industry. And I want to show who is this professional industry and what they are doing. So basically, instead of putting Airbnb in, at the center, I think that the main intermediaries are property managers, professional property managers, professional short-term rentals property managers. In Barcelona, we have 300 professional short-term rental property managers who actually are the people who manage the, all the licenses that exist in the city, 9,600. But there are professional property managers that have become global corporations right now. They have attracted seeds of investment, of institutional investment. And for example, Vacasa, they manage more than 30,000 properties. Interhome, 40,000 properties. Osonder, who is in Barcelona, 6,000 properties. So we are seeing the coming of, of big brands that want to replicate what hotels are doing, the big brands, hotel big brands uh, are, are doing. And the point, the interesting point, is how these property managers rely on technology to uh, basically to guarantee high occupancy rates and also revenues. So I put here direct marketing because it's, it's, it's very important the direct marketing that they do. They, they want to get rid of the platforms, Airbnb booking, because the, the platforms get a commission, a fees, you have to pay 16%. And so they, they more and more are working on direct marketing. And so they position on Google. And so this is, this is very important because this is, this is challenged quite a lot the way we also scrape data about Airbnb and we think that Airbnb is the, has the monopoly of the market and, and I think that they, they don't. There are other platforms and also there are direct marketing. And the software that they use to distribute their portfolio in different platforms is Channel Managers, which is a software used by the hotel industry for many years ago. So Airbnb has become a, a distribution channel, like many others uh, in the market. Then, of course, Airbnb knows about this. Of course, Airbnb knows that the money is in the professional market, and they have created tools for professional uh, people, for professional property managers. Actually, the API of Airbnb is open since 2015, so everybody can connect the software to Airbnb in 2015. Before that, they made personal agreements with, with some companies. And then, to complicate more the situation, in recent years, we have seen the growth of meta searches in the vacation rental industry. Even Google has vacation rental search, but there are more. Holidu, home to go but there are many others. And the important thing is that channel managers are connected directly with these meta searches, so avoiding the use of Airbnb, booking, et cetera, et cetera. So the thinking that we all just need to fight against Airbnb, I think, is, uh, is, is misleading in the sense that the market is much more complicated. And then another software, very important software, that the you are PMES, Property Management Systems. So the, the PMES is the operational software that property managers use, and it's very complete. They have a lot of things to automate everything and to collect data about the market in, on, on a daily basis. Um, and just the final picture for me, who, to complicate it even more, is that every, all the PMES who are at the bottom basically now are all in one PMES, they are able to do everything. They are able to, dis to, to do the operational, uh, uh, operational work and also do the online distribution. And, also, and importantly, they are on the cloud. They, they, we are not talking about 
a hard a computer on a desk. So basically, from a mobile phone, you can do this to have access to, to all this. And that, and that means that this is very important because, for example, uh, that means that anyone from home with a mobile phone can have a very important can be a very important property manager, so managing uh, 20, 40, 50 properties. Sometimes they rely on just one people with a mobile phone. They they just need they just need cleaners and maintenance people who goes to the to uh, to the properties. And this is very important because all these technologies are in Europe and the U.S., but they can land in other places, and they can go to Latin America, to Asia to Southern Europe, to Africa, and this is what they're doing, actually. They are growing a lot in, in these places. Another interesting thing of this is uh, how the, the platform, the, the OTAS, and what happened with the pan in, during the pandemic. Because basically, during the pandemic, hotels uh, closed down, but the short-term rental market was very resilient because with these multi-channel distribution strategies, they were able to go to a different market, so the student accommodation um, demand, like uh, UniPlaces, which is a platform for student accommodation, or for digital nomads, or midterm rentals, et cetera, et cetera. And short-term rentals became very resilient during the pandemic, while hotels were, were closed down. Uh, and also, this technology is very important for, for the guests, because the guests, just with a mobile phone, can have access to all of this. And even they, they just can do the reservation and even open the door at the, at the apartment, do everything with a mobile phone. And this is very f important, as I will mention uh, later. So all this structure, all these very professionalized property managers can warranty very high occupancy rates. And this is, and the model has been proved, and now they are doing this at a scale. And this is why the property owners are, are no anymore individual property owners that, of course, there are, who give the management of the property to these people, but also institutional investors, different kind of institutional investors. <laughs> and then, uh, finally, I, I would like to talk a bit about the demand and why uh, this market will grow even more in the future. And this is very interesting. This is a report from Goldman Sachs, the bank, the American bank. And they made a report about the alternative accommodation landscape, October 2021. And this report is basically to inform investors of why this market will be very profitable in the future. And it's very interesting to see what they say. For example, in terms of, of, of demand, they are, they are doing surveys and a lot of studies to, to understand the consumer behavior. And they're, and they're saying that, for example, 2005, only 5% of American travelers will use short-term rentals. But we see the, the difference between 2019 and 2020. So the, the pandemic has consolidated this market. And one of the reasons is sales isolation. It was very, it was, it was, you feel safe in an apartment in terms of sharing uh, the rooms of a hotel with other people. So also, we, we have seen during the pandemic remote working, people going to come into Southern Europe, for example, for a few months. In Lisbon, that was incredible. American families going to Lisbon and renting three, five months uh, uh, apartments. So it's also the, the blending of travel and work and longer stays. This is, this is happening, and there are surveys about this and how this will grow in the future. And, and as a consequence, actually, there are hotels converting into uh, short-term rentals. And this is happening in Barcelona, for example. Uh, five minutes, OK. So I'm uh, just two or three more slides, please. And this is also a generational thing, generational thing. In this uh, Goldman Sachs survey, they, they say, people using short-term rentals are especially younger. And among the younger are especially uh, those with higher income. So if you apply this in the future, the, pro the, the prospections in the future are very important for them. They, they, were, they were saying that by 2050, there will be basically 3 billion uh, potential customers that will prefer short-term rentals than hotels, who are digitally native. So this is why they just want everything in, in the mobile phone. Well, this is not a mobile phone, but OK. So, 
And also the, they will, because of the experience economy, they will prefer certain rentals because they are more authentic than, uh, than hotels. And just uh, this, uh, the last survey from this report about digital nomadism because of the pandemic, how it has reinforced this trend. So basically, they are saying 65% of Americans want to be full-time remote workers. But, but especially, they refer among young professionals in the technology and finance uh, sectors. And among all this uh, potential demand, 5% are, are willing to spend six months traveling per year. And this only in America, will mean one and a half million people. This is just American market. And they knew that these people will be traveling around, around the world, that this amount of people will rise in the future because of a generational thing. And of course, these people have very higher incomes, more than the average. And just the, the final point is how um, corporate travel, how corporations are, are, are changing hotels for short-term rentals. Even universities are doing that. Before, it was not allowed to go to a short-term rental, and now you can rent a short-term rental. And for example, Amazon has already made an agreement with a company, and all the workers will go to apartments. And they spend 80 million euros per year just in, a, just in accommodation. So taking just the conclusion, so taking into account the, the supply structure and the growing demand. So, so of course, both things together means uh, institutional investors are very interested in this, uh, in this market. They will come even in, in, more, in bigger numbers than before, than ever before. I think we are at the beginning of something very big. Uh, also, the power they have to land and apply this scheme in every place in the world. And also, it is expected the rise of transnational mobile populations who want to uh, have a nice time in a cheaper and exciting place offering lifestyles. I think uh, this is what will happen in the, in the near future, and I think regulations need to be prepared for that, especially if we are talking about the mid-term rental, what they call flexible living. Uh, just, just one example for, uh, to finish. In, Bar in Barcelona, they, the, um, the 9,000 uh, licenses, so th there is no more licenses. So the, the city council don't give more licenses from 2014. But a license means that you need to rent that apartment for 30 days or less. But if you rent an apartment for two months, so you, are, you bypass the regulation. And investors are very aware of this. And institutional investors, all the operation that I have seen in the last year in Barcelona is for midterm rentals. And, and, and in fact, there are property managers that only focus on midterm rentals. And this, and this market will grow in the future. Another example is the student accommodation. A student accommodation that actually yesterday, uh, a UK investment fund has bought two big apartments for student accommodations in Barcelona. They, they rent to students in the winter, but they rent on Airbnb and Booking.com in the summer. So there are different products that are merging, this different lengths of stay, of stay and the problem that I see is that regulations are very uh, strict in the sense that doesn't match with the reality of the market. And, and there, I, I think that we have a huge uh, challenge uh, to do. So thank you. Thank um, you very much. I have to say that more than a presentation that looked like a terror movie, honestly. So, no, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, I think that we share the feeling that sometimes life goes too fast. And, and uh, even for me, it's very difficult to, well, to keep every, all these uh, new platforms and technologies uh, and all the possibilities. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to invite Dimitris Petas uh, to present, and it will be maybe another side of the coin. 
Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will go through how the justification process unfolded in central Athens over the last years, especially focusing on the district of Exarchia, that's a very specific neighborhood in Athens. So first, some things about how the justification resembles, but also differentiates from conventional modes of gentrification. Uh, the impact of touristification, as we have seen in literature, current literature, also accounts for the creation of rent caps and the displacement of permanent residents. It causes shifts in land uses and services, also disturbances in the everyday life of residents and this uh, loss of the sense of belonging in a neighborhood, especially through rec the recodification of local symbolism and history in specific uh, neighborhoods and cities. However, touristification differentiates in some aspects. It has most severe impact on peripheral economies that largely rely on tourism, referring to Europe. This has to do with Mediterranean cities such as Greece, Spain, Italy, especially in countries that, and cities that went through the process of austerity urbanism and every narrative that opposes touristic development of, or has some, uh, raised some issues concerning sustainable models of tourism face extreme criticism as tourism accounts for a large part of the country's GDP. Also, very interesting is the relational character of class shifts and the, as those who are responsible, the gentrifiers in these cases are lifestyle migrants and tourists coming from abroad and not wealthy households from the same cities. Also, touristification initially developed in a bottom-up way in their early stages, especially concerning short-term rentals. This was the case in Athens. It was middle and low-income households that tried through Airbnb to make a living during the crisis. And also, it has a differentiated impact upon local economy and public services as facilities and public services such as uh, schools, hospitals, or businesses addressed to every day, and regular residents are closing down. So Athens, until very recently, was considered to be an ungentrifiable city. Uh, this was because the segregation had a vertical character in Athens, so we have mixed neighborhoods in social, ethnic, and income terms. Mixed land uses and diversity within the neighborhoods. Very high rates compared to the European average of home ownership that in Athens was 72% in 2011. The complete absence of housing policies, uh, also including tenants protection policies. Despite that, uh, until very recently, the, the access to affordable housing was satisfactory in Athens. However, the economic crisis very fast translated into housing one, uh, leading to increase in property taxation, housing insecurity, energy poverty, indebted households, and evictions. Also, again, in terms of introductory to the context of Athens, uh, Athens very recently, over the last six or seven years, experienced a very sudden uh, turn from a one-day stop to a year-round city break destination. Uh, despite the fact that in the first years of the crisis, tourist arrivals dropped uh, overall in Greece, there was later an increase of 56% between 2013 to 2016. There are multiple factors that led to this development, like the increased connectivity of Athens with European cities through low-cost airlines, political instability and agonic destinations such as Turkey, also cultural shifts in tourism and this pursuit for the authentic experience that the diverse landscape of Athens could offer. Also for me it's very important how the crisis was exoticized uh, in European and press concerning narratives that were related to grassroots political activity. The document exhibition was emblematic in that case that for the first time it took place partly outside castle in Germany, and it was building on these narratives, leading to an inflow of artists and researchers, so people who wanted to live and experience these exoticized versions of the crisis in Athens. As a result, in 2019, we had 6.3 million visitors, as opposed to 2.5 million in 2012. So I will focus in Exarchia, that's a very specific neighborhood in Athens, uh, that is the epicenter of uh, social and political activity for social movements, social and solidarity economy. It hosts a lot of squads, social venues, political organizations, but also it's a point of reference for creative professionals in Athens. So, uh, there were two waves of touristification in Exarchia. The first one, up to 2017, uh, was related 
with the international recognition of grassroots initiatives and social movements, especially after the riots of December 2008. This kind of visitors that initially went to visit Athens comprised of young people that were coming in Exarchia, especially artists, activists, that as people say there, there was a cultural proximity. So people who were actually engaged in what the local movements did in the neighborhood. However, the second wave was very much related with this crisis and resistance narrative. So we have media reproducing and commercializing many aspects of the crisis and the ways uh, people tried to cope with that. Also, the refugee crisis was had to do with the inflow of many people described in the neighborhoods as voluntaries, so people who came to work for NGOs and resided in Airbnbs in the neighborhood. These are some very indicative uh, article titles from this period, relating again, providing a romanticized version of the crisis in Athens, and also relating this to the art scene, the blooming art scene in Athens. Of course, Exarchia is a residential area, that meaning that uh, there was no infrastructure to accommodate this increased demand for uh, tourist accommodation, and this is where short-term rentals came in. And we can see the bloom in just four years, they were more than tripled in the neighborhood. So, uh, I will start with the impact of, on housing. Uh, as it was expected, large part of the housing stock moved to the short red, rental market, initially initiated by people who were struggling um, with the crisis, the survival cost, and the increased housing cost during the period. But gradually, as Augustine described, this in, uh, concerning Barcelona, the same thing happens to Athens. Uh, listings, the share of the market that relates to professional manager is increasing, and now more than 30% of the listings in Athens come from investors and companies that have more than five uh, listings, that manage more than five listings. We have an increase in rent prices by 30%, and increased housing security, direct and direct displacement. So people uh, had, were kicked out of their houses, especially since there is no framework for uh, tenants protection in Athens and no relevant policies. Um, Especially concerning the vertical segregation, people who are living in lower and in lower floors and basements, usually migrants or really poor people, had to relocate because even though those apartments were not uh, attractive to other people who lived in Athens, since concerning short-term rentals, the location is more important than the characteristics of the apartment, they, became, they had some value now and they were turned into Airbnbs. And also there is this increased sense of uh, housing and security, people living in the area, even though they are not displaced. Now they feel like their next house, house won't be, cannot be in the neighborhood. Uh, concerning short-term rentals, there are two very specific and distinct processes through which it affects housing, they affect housing. The first relates to the process of home and making and the creation of hybrid workspaces in cities. So in the frame of the increased professionalization, as Augustine mentioned, uh, there are many professionals like cleaners, um, hired hosts, uh, like young people, skilled young people who are hired to operate as hosts, uh, architects, photographers who work in the apartments. And this is not grasped by current regulations. Even the EU does not consider Airbnb to be a labor-intensive platform, but only a platform that facilitates access to assets. However, this is not the case, especially in this increased professionalization. So you have workspaces that, in legal terms, belong in the private sphere, in the social reproduction sphere, but what's happening is that they operate as hotel rooms. Uh, also, this commodification financialization of housing. It's very representative that in Greece, in Athens, many people are buying apartments, renovate them, and then run them for a year through Airbnb, and then sell them not as housing units, but as business. Okay. Concerning local businesses, there is monofunctionality. The area that already hosted numerous commercial activities now is transformed to a party zone. And it's very important that opposing uh, dominant narratives in Athens, not every business benefits from touristification. So it's only businesses that can relate to these tourism inflows, they can provide service to tourism that actually benefit from that. 
Uh, otherwise, uh, repair, car repairing uh, shops or uh, stationery or clothes, uh, these are businesses that are going out in order to be replaced mostly by service industry. So precarious uh, creative pro professionals and political activity are undermined by this process. They are being displaced or struggling with increasing housing costs. Of course, many of them have to rent their, uh, their shops or their political venues, and they are also struggling uh, with increasing rent costs. Also, concerning social movements, their pool of supporters and beneficiaries, especially concerning solidarity networks, it's also diminishing as they have to move out of the neighborhood. So this, this social movements now that used to build a social fabric in the neighborhood are feeling like they don't have a purpose there anymore. Also, it's very important how Exarchia's history, collective memory has been commodified, uh, exploited, commercialized. So ongoing struggles in the neighborhood are becoming part of the spectacle for tourists and visitors. There are guided tours in places where people were killed by the police, for example, while values, notions, memories, and social innovation practices are recoded to fit into this narrative uh, of tourism. This is also the case for the municipality of Athens that clearly stated that they want to turn Exarchia into the Montmartre of Athens. In order to resist touristification, uh, local movements, uh, also artist um, initiatives, they try to incorporate the issue in their agendas, in their projects. So there are many events relating to touristification, uh, many public events organized by the social movements that are also trying to interrelate this process with the large-scale attack on social venues in the neighborhood squads and informal refugee housing projects. So they see touristification as a step in a, in a broader process that tries to undermine the political character of the neighborhood. At the same time, social movements are facing increased complexity. As, as Augustine described, it's a very complex process. So it involves actors that are not situated in the neighborhood, or in the area, or in the city. We have international investors, we have platforms, we have digital means, uh, we have tourists coming from all over the world. So there is, no, there is not a clear, uh, well-defined enemy within, within the neighborhood. Uh, the social movements feel that this increased complexity is creating problems on how to oppose these kind of processes. Uh, also, Unlike cities like Barcelona or Berlin, there is a complete mistrust between social movements and the municipality and the local government. Um, at the same time, the municipality of Athens, despite the fact that now very clear demands are, be pla are being placed uh, to them by the social movements, they don't have the institutional capacity to design or implement actual policies that will try to to, uh, to oppose the touristification processes. Concluding, um, I consider this decoding and recoding processes that undermine local history, meanings, and symbolisms as very important in touristification processes uh, in cities that have, and especially in neighborhoods and districts that have prolonged history of political antagonism that's now turned into a commodity. Uh, also, we have to understand displacement as something more than population shift. So in, in Exarchia, it's accompanied by increased sense of housing security, alienation, and direct displacement that overall contribute to a condition of vulnerability, especially for low-income populations. At the same time, it seems that in Athens, touristification managed to do what conventional process of gentrification could not do and have this kind of development. For the future, I will, I will also focus on what uh, was said before about uh, digitalization of labor and digital nomads, because Athens is also going through the same process. We have people from all over the world who come to stay in Athens over the winter in mid-term accommodation, creating bubbles, uh, also consumption bubbles in the center of the city from which locals are excluded. Um, and also this has to do with the fact that uh, in cities like Athens, people who come from middle-income middle income people coming from countries such as Germany, Denmark, uh, are allowed to have a 
more comfortable position in the housing market as the income is completely different. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. So, well, after the terror movie, now we are all crying, sort of. Uh, thank you, Dimitris, for such a, a, an interesting insight from what's going on in Athens, which, despite the differences, I think it's quite similar to what might be happening in cities like Barcelona or Berlin or, or other popular cities for tourists. And so now we are moving to our third presenter, uh, Nancy Holmes from the London School of Economics. Uh, Nancy, whenever you want. Thank you. Um, does this thing work? Yeah, as well. Perfectly well. Perfectly. So I can move around if I need to. You can, you can oh, go in middle man. of the stage. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll try not to walk off the edge. <gasps> Please. Um, all right. So I'd like to talk a little bit differently today, um, perhaps slightly differently than what people have talked about before. I'm, I'm a planner by background, and I tend to look at this stuff through kind of the idea of regulation and how regulation shapes place and also how it makes a relationship between planners and residents. And I think that's kind of an important thing to do. And for a lot of you who will know, um, England is full of rhetoric at the moment. So I thought we would start with a quote by our potentially new prime minister, Liz Truss, who made it in 2018 who said Airbnb landlords are freedom fighters. Um, so just to give you a context of my daily hell, there you go. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the impacts of Airbnb or short-term letting in London and talk a little bit about gentrification with kind of a question mark there. Um, then regulation planners, residents and impacts a little bit of the misfortune of a centralized state, which I think is the big message that I want to get across here, and then kind of a, if I'm trying to be positive, so what next? Um, my students always say I'm not positive. I try. I really do try, but I'm old, and now I'm cynical. So if we just start off with looking at the numbers in London, and like everybody else, this is from inside Airbnb, um, this is London at the moment. This is during pandemic numbers, so this is not pre-pandemic and it's not um, where post-pandemic is going. But you see around 66,000 homes being rented. 58% of those are entire homes. And 44% of the houses um, that are being rented are um, houses in... Um, multiple people with multiple ownership of those houses. So people can have dozens, hundreds that they're renting out on the platform. And I want to just look at this. If you look at the kind of um, map as you see it, you can see that it's the central areas that are hardest hit by Airbnb. And as you can imagine, those are your sort of tourist hotspots. So if you look at just one specific area. This is Westminster. It's a place that we've done a lot of work in and we've done interviews. Um, they've got, at the moment, and again, during COVID times, around 7,000 homes. 73% um, of those are entire homes and 66% are people who have multiple listings. So, you know, it's a pretty significant problem and it looks a little bit like a business rather than something that just people are doing on the off chance when they're on their holidays. Um, it's really interesting as well to think about somewhere like Westminster because obviously they've had a long and historic problem with housing being used for short-term letting. It's obviously a tourist attraction and a good place to stay, but it's also a place that they've had a lot of problems with health tourism over the years. There are a lot of ho hospitals actually in Westminster that are very popular and they have for years and years had people come in from other countries stay for short-term purposes and have operations in one of those hospitals. So it's always, it's got this historic problem. Um, in terms of gentrification, I think it, there are a couple ways we need to think about this. So London has a housing crisis and London has a housing problem. But if I'm thinking about gentrification in the term of displacement, in terms of people getting direct impacts happening to them, I kind of think about it more in terms of blocks of flats. Because in blocks of flats, you do see people actually getting 
actively displaced because the flats next to them and the flats next to them and the flats next to them are also Airbnbs and people eventually stop being able to or wanting to live there or if they're on a tenancy, their landlord realizes they could make a lot more money doing something else. But you also have this problem here, and I think this is a really significant problem, and it was told to us by um, one of the enforcement officers at um, Kensington and Chelsea. And they said, you know, we had one big block of flats come in. It was 11 flats that we had just got developed, and, you know, you're hoping that's going to go into your housing market because we've got high housing demand, we've got a high um, council house waiting list, but actually, the evidence was that all 11 of those flats went immediately into short-term letting. And so these are the kinds of things that are really, I think, are very indicative of what part short-term letting plays in something like gentrification. Um, if you look, this was a recent study out probably within the last couple months. 40% um, of under 30s are paying under unaffordable rents now, um, and that's across the UK. And there's been a 40% rise in short-term lettings in the last three years. Um, there was another study I read this morning that came out in the newspaper, so it didn't get in here as a slide, blessedly for all of you, so I'm not going to keep belaboring points. But that was done by Generation Rent in London, who are kind of showing the just level of competition you have to go through just simply to get a flat. And, you know, people are actually fighting over the worst of places and paying exorbitant fees. Um, and the other thing that I thought was very interesting in that is they talked about um, platforms like um, Spare Room. If any of you are like under 30 and have lived in London, you know Spare Room because that's how you find your bed sit flat with 900 of your closest friends. Um, they're like 50-year-olds now entering the market to try to find rooms in London with strangers. So, you know, it's a really different kind of thing. But we can't say that this is all down to short-term letting. Obviously, London has hugely complex housing problems. Short-term le letting is a part of that but it's not the totality of that. And I think it's really important for us to understand. But the big problem within short-term letting is that it accentuates a problem that is already there and is already really significant. It's just kind of another nail in the coffin, if you will. So this is where I want to talk a little bit about regulation, and I promise it's not boring. Regulation is fascinating. I swear to God it is. Um, the first regulation, and this is only about London, this only applied to London, um, was the 1973 Local Government Act, and basically it said that if you wanted to rent out a property on a short-term basis during the year, you would have to get planning permission to change from a regular dwelling house into a short-term letting accommodation, right? So there are a couple of important things here. One, why were they doing it? If you go back and read the debates and everything else, it was because they were absolutely terrified that London, especially central London, was going to turn into just a large hotel, and they weren't going to be able to maintain um, workers for the economy in these inner London boroughs. So that was one big, big reason. But the other thing that's important, and this is going to go on to that idea about a central state that we need to understand, is that was an act of parliament, right? In order to have the permission to do that, it was a national piece of legislation that went through. So hold that in your heads, because that's important. Um, then we have kind of what I would call the regulatory illusion. So in 2015, when the government decided to do a bonfire of red tape and get rid of needless reg regulation because we all need to embrace the market, yada, 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 we got a new kind of... Um, thing that looks like a regulation if you read it. And it's basically that you're allowed to rent out your property as short-term letting in London if you do it for no more than 90 nights in a calendar year, and if you are the person liable to pay council tax. Now, that's not a 
complete taking away of a regulation, that's a government saying, no, we're still going to have a regulation. We're just going to have this regulation rather than the earlier regulation, which was really too strict. So this is kind of an illusion, and I'll show you why in a minute. This really didn't work in terms of what it was designed to do. What you also got was a regulatory solution that came out of this when people were very upset that the other regulation wasn't working, which was, hey, look, we don't need government regulation. We'll just let the market do the job, which we've seen in countless places like New Orleans as well, where you get the regulatory solution being Airbnb is just going to remove your property if you're doing it for more than 90 nights. Home and Away and TripAdvisor followed suit in 2020, but it didn't come with any data sharing. It was just kind of a goodwill gesture to remove the properties. Now, the regulatory reality in all of this is, first off, there's no register of properties in London, so you don't know who is and who isn't short-term letting. You have no way of knowing that except from the neighbors. There are absolutely scads of platforms, as we've seen already. And so if Airbnb removes your property, you go over to TripAdvisor. And if TripAdvisor removes your property, you go to the next one. And frankly, you could just keep skipping from one to one to one and always maintain an entire year's worth of the ability to advertise. There are also countless ways to dodge and evade doing this. You change the name of the um, building. You change the description slightly. Billions of ways to get around that. And then the big deal is that enforcement requires a huge amount of work. So you remember I said before there was the regulation which was really cut and dried. If you're going to do this, you have to have a change of use. You have to go and register it, which means if I detect you, you're naughty, you're bad, you're doing the thing you're not supposed to do. Now, the enforcement is you can do it for 90 nights in a calendar year. But how, as a local authority officer, do I know you've done it for 90 nights or 89 nights, right? And what happens is you've got to have neighbors who are very willing to sit and document and watch and write down on little pieces of paper and kind of become the kind of people you don't really want to ever become as a neighbor where you're actually, you know, jotting down, taking photos, you know, James Bond style stuff. So that is time consuming and unlikely. And then the worst part about this, the real sting in the tail, is the 90 nights run in a calendar year. So one of the council officers was explaining they had an enforcement that they were trying to do. The neighbors had been great. They had done everything. They had got up to 88 nights. They had pure proof. Unfortunately, it was the end of the year. It was December 31st. And so the clock restarts on the 1st of January. And so you literally can just live next to somebody doing that for you know, just so many nights and just so many nights in that, in that calendar year, you just get a huge problem. So the regulatory reality is that it doesn't actually work. So from the point of view of planners, and this is something I'm very interested in, from the point of view of planners and the point of view of their residents, what you see is that the planner here is saying, you know, that the people just don't really understand the legislation. They strongly believe that the legislation says you can enforce this because there's a regulation but they just don't understand that it's impossible to police and it's just not going to happen. Even when, in places like Westminster, they've hired, I think it was half a dozen new officers just to work on this alone, it's still very, very almost impossible to do. So I told you I would say something about a central state. If you think of the government as kind of the foot of God and the city as the thing that gets stamped on. This is the sort of way government works in the UK, local government. You are not allowed to do anything as a city that central government doesn't explicitly say you can do. Hence, as I told you before, the um, Local Government Act, which gave London the permission to regulate short-term letting, was an act of parliament. So once that's gone, 
you can't just go back as a city and say, hey, actually, you know what, we liked it before better. So we're just going to keep doing that. Are you good with that? Because central government always trumps. And if they take that power away, you no longer have that power. So five minutes, I'm good. Max, no, 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 some problem. I can do it in four. <laughs> so how do people push back against this? Well, one of the planners was saying, you know, it's really, at the end of the day, it's going to have to be a governmental thing. We're going to have to figure it out via that. The Greater London Authority would like to be involved, but who knows how much power they're going to have. And that's another thing that has to be negotiated. Um, and it's wonderful to be able to look to Europe and see what other cities are doing and say, maybe London should do this. But it's always going to be as a matter of lobbying. It's never going to be as a matter of doing unless you have that permission to do it. So the kinds of things that gov um, we can do, politics is the first. The most likely way of getting a handle back on short-term letting in London or in the UK in, or England specifically is through political action. We basically need to have a new act of parliament that re-regulates this in a more sensible way. Um, there is a lot of support for this. There's a Labour MP from Westminster called Karen Buck. She has now twice suggested that we have regulations around this and has proposed a bill in Parliament and has twice been shot down. But she's trying. Um, and the government has just in June released a new call for evidence on short-term letting. If any of you are um, researchers in short-term letting, and especially if you're English and you would like to write evidence and you would say the kinds of things I'd want you to, um, please do take a look at that. But there is a call for evidence at the moment. It's really framed around the tourist economy and trying to maintain the tourist economy, but at least it does make some nods to this being a significant kind of problem for communities and for housing in general. So there's the political answer. The other answer is politics. Um, not politics, sorry, kind of pressure power. Um, there is a really, really good article um, that was done by one of Loretta Lee's PhD students in Leicester. She's the first author, not Loretta Lee's. This author, whose name I cannot remember, it's written in my computer, I am so sorry. Nice, nice lady who wrote this very, very good article that looked at what people can do. And we've looked here at some of you guys talking about like artist collectives and things like that. Hers is an auto kind of ethnography of her living in a building in Westminster that had gone over to Airbnb and just the simple things they did, like writing notes and slipping them under doors, going, hey, we live here. Could you not, you know, have sex in the hallway? It'd be cool if you didn't do that, thanks or putting signs up in the building. And things that are polite but annoying. You can do things that are just simply annoying in the building. You can do things to kind of disrupt that business model of the person who is renting for way more than 90 nights in a year. So that's one of the other kind of solutions. It's very micro scale and probably isn't going to have a grand effect overall. Certainly not like primary legislation would. So. Finally, um, and I'm telling you it's four minutes. It's got to be four minutes. We're unlikely to get real change, I think, without kind of government approval. Um, there is some evidence that this is becoming more possible because the government's becoming more nervous about how much this is impacting on constituents in places like Kensington and Chelsea and also um, just the level of the housing crisis. Um, our only other real choice is microscale interventions, but I think we need to put our hope more in central government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. So, oh my God, <laughs> very, very, very interesting presentation. Wonderful pictures, by the way. Thank you. Uh, Right, uh, after listening to the three of you, and they do have questions uh, that I thought about uh, before, 
I think that I might summarize uh, my, my first question, and please, audience, think about yours, because I'm sure that there will be a lot of, uh, of questions. Do we have the microphone ready? But uh, I would like to, the, the three of you uh, mentioned policy, politics, regulatory power, well, from different perspectives. No? So my question would be, right, so gentrification happens, touristification or tourism might be one of the reasons um, we are witnessing an increase of technology uh, I don't know how to how to say that but um, um, promoting or, or supporting that's the word supporting the extension of this kind of uh, short uh, term lettings so what in your opinion what would you say about politics or about policy or what should be done because we didn't pay much attention uh, in the three presentations so, sort of we were uh, stating facts maybe you uh, Nancy went a little bit more in depth into that but what can we do I mean what would you tell uh, politicians uh, those that are responsible for the local well-being in general for tourists and for um, neighbors uh, okay. Yeah. Can, I, can I say? Agustin, it's working. You can start, yes, of course. now it's working. So, such a complicated question, <laughs> you two. Uh, I think, um, well, first of all, there are different levels here. This is not just housing market, because if we talk about touristification or gentrification, we also need to consider public space and retail spaces, uh, etc. There are a lot of things going on at the same time. But what I, what I feel is that uh, what happened in many cities is that they tried to put a cap, like stop giving licenses, when it was too late. And that happened in Barcelona, in Lisbon, and in many other places. And when you reach that level, to go down in the intensity of the business is impossible because, I mean, expropriation or, or closing down businesses is basically, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Or if the government wants to buy this business, I mean, they don't have budget to do that. So the first, the first conclusion for me is to, to do it before. This is, this, is very, this is very important. Uh, and why is very important? Because uh, this, this market, it will grow in other places. I mean, in, in, for example, if we think in Spain and Portugal, who are the markets that I know better, doing interviews with, with investors and property managers, they, they told me, uh, well, Barcelona is, uh, is already uh, over packet. So, um, it's very difficult to grow there because there are uh, strict regulations, regulations, strict regulations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Madrid also, there are a lot of supply. But now the new uh, opportunities are in Valencia, Valencia. Malaga, Bilbao, uh, San Sebastián, Santiago, Sevilla. And, and those people, what will happen is, ah, okay, ah, yes, more business, more growth. And then we'll, st we'll again put regulations when it's too late. Oh, so, the, the, I mean, I think in Barcelona is very complicated, if not impossible. But at least we can learn from here to other places. Okay, good. Dimitris, any, uh, anything to add? In Athens, I didn't mention there is no regulation, actually, concerning Airbnb or short-term no. rentals. There is just taxation as if the properties are uh, part of the conventional rental market. Uh, I think it's important that Airbnb and short-term rentals do not account, are not responsible for, we are not accused for the overall housing problems that exist in Athens. Because there are no housing policies, there are no tenant protection framework. Yeah, so I think it's important that alongside with regulating Airbnb and short-term rentals is to create a more resilient resilient housing landscape that also offers solutions outside the market. That in, in Athens, it's not the case. We don't have social housing. Mm -hmm. We do not have any modes of cooperative housing. So there are no alternatives outside the market that renders this housing market more vulnerable to this kind of uh, mm -hmm. pressures from short-term rentals and Airbnb. Concerning short-term rentals specific, I think it's important to stop this increased prof professionalization because we're seeing this happening in, in Greece, in Spain. So in Athens also, 85% of the listings concern whole apartments 
And as I said before, like more than 30% below, uh, of the listings belong to big companies and investors. So I, I have to recognize the fact that it, during the crisis, Airbnb helped initially some families to survive. So I think it doesn't have to be horizontal. Yeah, yeah. You have to allow some people maybe to make a living, but at the same time prevent this from becoming very, very attractive for investor for funds and big companies. Good. Nancy, do you want to add something? Or no, I think, I mean, to be very honest, roughly what I said before, I think the context matters greatly because it does matter your political system, what you can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that they're suggesting in the UK is to do what they've done with holiday houses or second homes, mm -hmm. which is to double the council tax if you're doing that, which sounds like a really punitive, great thing until you realize that somewhere like Westminster, the council tax for a year is 1,700 pounds for the year. So if you double that, that's more than 1,700 pounds. I'm gonna to try to do the maths in my head, but you know, it's, some, it's, <laughs> it's more money. Lot. But it's not the same amount of money that you would be making on that Airbnb property. Oh, so okay. if you double my council tax, that isn't going to eat into my profits very much, unless unlike the properties you were talking about that are rented less, would take those properties and, mm -hmm. and cause a difficulty, but it would do almost nothing to those properties that are under big agglomerations, because why do they care if they're paying 3K or, you know, four, you know it doesn't matter. Uh, is, if there is any question, please just raise your hand and otherwise, yes, that is a question, yeah, there, and there. Hello, you're all looking at the public uh, enforcement, which is of course important, but next to this you can have also have private enforcement, especially in apartment buildings, if you have apartment rights, which you don't have in England. You have often a deed indicating what, how you should use the apartment and that you should refrain it from use it for sex work, boarding houses. And often, sometimes, you can use that as neighbor to enforce it. And also, when you have renters, landlords can also sometimes indicate. So, next to the public sector, which can do lots, I mean, in, in my country, only one night is enough to enforce them, so that's a lot easier to prove than 90. Uh, but uh, the private enforcement, you also have chances, and I didn't hear anything about it. Thank you. Any reaction? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, in council housing especially, where you do have regulations where you're not allowed to sublet, um, it is easier to get an enforcement because you're clearly making an infraction that is against your lease. Um, some properties do have leases like this as well, that you might have some leeway um, to do something legal. Um, but it's also a big process to try to do that. And a lot of people don't want to put the time, money, effort, energy into that. Um, however, you do have a good point that there are ways of doing that private kind of thing. And also, especially around things like fire regulations, et cetera, et cetera. Are you renting something that's unsafe? that also is something that is a lever that you can pull. It's just not quite big enough. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question. Um, yeah, also thank you for the three insights into the cities. My question, when I looked at the image of the state of, um, um, of Nancy's foot, um, the Millennium Dome had spikes. Yes. And I really thought that these spikes were actually interesting to, to think of the city level. Or to think of actually maybe a medium level, I've just wondered why you left it out. Because in a way, if we think of the idea of, I don't know, the, maybe the glorified idea of rebel cities or of what, what actually, how cities can oppose um, state regulations or, or aid others. Um, could you sure. add I mean, something there? Yes, uh, I th it was a good metaphor with the spikes. It was an unintended thing. It was the best landscape picture I could get on um, Unsplash for the free photo. However, you have a good point. I mean, within London, the kind of spikes that we do have are very blunted um, because we really seriously cannot act outside legislation. However, what we can do is lobby and the Westminster, Kensington and Chelsea, Camden and 
the GLA, so the regional level of government, have worked really hard and worked really hard together to at least represent to central government what the problem is. And I think, arguably, if you didn't have that cohesiveness of voices, you wouldn't, we wouldn't be getting at least into having um, a call for evidence. May I just add one um, addition? Um, because um, if one could look into the initiative of, of all the of European cities um, uh, collecting or, or combining their energy and efforts um, when it came to actually social housing being under threat mm. by Maastricht criteria and, and European mm. community um, legislation. So I think if there was something of like cities kind of collaborating um, more mm -hmm. strongly, I'm just wondering if these initiatives are there mm. since there's so many cities um, mm -hmm. burdens, uh, mm -hmm. burdened mm -hmm. by this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think, to be very honest, those are the sorts of ways that grassroots can actually have something that's a little bit more um, toothy, has a little bit more power, because you actually have city governments coming together as well. I think sometimes we um, view our local bureaucracies as problems, but they can also be solutions. Thank you. Um, we do have a question here. <clears throat> Thank you. Congratulations to all the speakers. Just a couple of questions. Uh, first, specifically in relation to the situation in London, and to Nancy. Um, you underlined that it's necessary uh, central intervention. Mm. And I have understood that uh, apparently the local government is not able, from a legal point of view, of developing mm -hmm. policies in that field. Mm -hmm. It sounds strange to me because, generally speaking, uh, zoning, I mm. mean, the possibility of enacting planning regulations, is a well known power in relation ah. to local uh, government. So I really appreciate any other, because, for example, Barcelona has, has used that. that power. Yeah, no, yeah. no. So for the UK, in mm -hmm. terms of our planning, we don't do zoning, we have a plan led system. But we're only allowed to do what is given to us by legislation to do. So I can't go in and decide my own housing numbers particularly. I can't do that. My housing numbers of how many housing units I have to deliver comes from the regional plan, which comes from central government, which determines the formula that I have to go by. It's all very centralized. So I can't just go and redetermine my land use categories or something along those lines because it, it really does pass down mm -hmm. very centrally. But that kind of uh, tourist apartments are at the end of the day a, a kind of use of land. Oh, I, they are. I, I imagine that the municipality of London is able of, um, I mean, regulating, I don't know, commercial issues, residential issues, parks, uh, facilities. Only within the bounds of what we're allowed to do by central government. Okay. So what we can't do is step outside that. Okay, huh? okay, okay. Which is interesting. Ah, sorry. No, no, no. And, and uh, to Just all of you, please. but especially to oh. Agustin, in relation to that that point that previous licenses or permits or the, the, the previous situation, then there is a regulation like in Barcelona, and then you can prohibit new uh, uh, tourist apartments, but you say. If I, if I understood it properly, that's not possible to touch previous situations. Is that right? To touch in, in which... In the sense of regulating or prohibiting previous situation, previous tourist apartments which are there. Well, yeah, you can uh, prohibit... Uh, you, can, you can't cancel those licenses, right? Well, I'm not sure about that, because if you have, again, the power of uh, zoning, the power of enacting uh, um, planning regulations, uh, I mean, citizens and business are obliged to adapt their activity to regulation. So in other cases, this is well known, so we can discuss that. But th I think this is an important point, and I do think that it's possible to do something with previous situations which must be adapted to the new urban regulation. I think it's important. Okay, yeah, it is a very important point. Yeah, yes, is, and I think is. that each city should like study that possibility. 
And in relation to enforcement, my last point, what about the use of artificial intelligence, algorithmic systems and big data to enforce that? Can I think that Barcelona is uh, using scraping, the tone, scraping, scraping, and other cities are trying to, it could, I don't know if you think that it could be a solution in the future. I mean, crossing data and trying to use those kind of systems to identify and to enforce regulation. I would like to hear something about that. Thank you. Yes, uh, Barcelona is using that technique and they are doing web scraping. Um, and the point is that the web scraping don't give you uh, this, the location of the, of the apartment. And so you need, to, you need to compare with different sources and pictures and trying to understand where it exactly is. Uh, and sometimes what, what they do is to, to book actually that accommodation and to pay the accommodation so they, give, they get the location and they go and they say, hi, we are inspectors. Yes. It's the same. West, Westminster does data scraping, um, but it's very difficult to. You don't have a geo referenced piece of information. You then are left going, Better. that balcony uh -huh. looks like that balcony. That must be that property, and trying to then to drive around and find it. Um, Westminster also has a street team where they go knock on doors, where they have um, places that they suspect are short term letting. And in many of those places, when if you get beyond the door, you'll see a list of things that the person who's inside the building is meant to say to the person who's inspecting the building. That's interesting. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, I don't know if there is anybody which definitely... There is an interesting point that we haven't deeply uh, analyzed, which is the relationship between gentrification well, we do, but uh, and touristification, if we might say so. Uh, I, I would love to to hear more. We don't have time. I know, Barbara, don't look at me that way. <laughs> uh, so we don't have much time. We don't have time, in fact, but uh, it would be interesting to see because we, we were discussing about short-term uh, rentals, and this is one part of the story, but uh, maybe it would be interesting to go further and see what is the impact on gentrification of uh, European cities. Uh, but since we have another conference in a year's time, and the topic is urban regeneration, I would suggest that for a plenary we do have a special uh, plenary on gentrification and urban regeneration, maybe. So thank you very much to all of you. We have Nuria now. And And we are, we are done. Yeah. Thank you all so much, Agustin, Dimitris, Nancy, and Monse, for this interesting and challenging plenary on tourism consequences. I think it is important to consider local consequences of tourism, economical, cultural, social, urban, and so on, but also global, environmental, consequences of tourism because of the huge ecological footprint of tourism due to flights, CO2 emissions. Let's not ignore that. And that brings me to the following, to the next topic. This is going to be actually the last plenary session of this year's European Network for Housing Research Conference. And we're going to use it to address one of the most relevant topics today. The debate to achieve sustainable and ecological housing that contributes to combating climate change and carbonization is extremely necessary and important. In fact, housing and buildings in general are a key element for the future of life on the planet. And as an architect, please allow me to share just a few numbers with you. Buildings generate 36% of CO2 emissions, 56% of pollution, and 33% of waste. In Spain, the building sector alone 
creates 45 million tons of construction and demolition waste every single year. That's the same as we say that each and every single person in Spain generates 1 million tons of construction waste each year without even being aware of that. And most of that waste ends up in illegal landfills with no recycling or reuse potential. The building sector also consumes a lot. It consumes 50% of raw materials, 50% of energy, and 33% of water. And if we talk about architecture and buildings, environmental footprint, we need to talk about concrete, one of the most commonly used materials worldwide. And I still remember an article in The Guardian uh, maybe we were about to share it, I don't know if it's going to be able, but we could, saw, we could see there that if concrete were a region, a territory, it would be the world's worst culprit when it comes to CO2 emissions just after China and the US. So with this data in mind, I think we have to own up to our own responsibilities, especially as architects, urban planners, designers, decision makers, and really work on designing and creating sustainable, efficient, net zero, flexible buildings based on low carbon emission and cradle to cradle materials, and also to focus in rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is the, probably the present and the future of architecture, especially in consolidated, dense European cities. Because at the end, the most sustainable thing to do is to expand the life of what already exists. But of course, aside from architecture, it is vital to create this holistic debate from different points of view and disciplines. And to, it is essential to raise awareness and to discuss the terms of sustainability and the role that housing can play. So in order to do so, we will count on Jen Jeremy Till, head of Central St. Martins and pro vice Chancellor of the University of the Arts of London. Gabo Handel, PhD professor of urbanism at the Institute of Technology in Nuremberg and diploma unit director at the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London. And also Ebru Ergos Karajan, associate professor at the University of Istanbul. Okay, but... <laughs> No, but before we go, I also have to say this session will be moderated by wonderful Catalina Turku, which is, who is Associate Professor of Sustainable Built Environment and Academic Director of City Partnership Stockholm at University College of London. And now that I have shared all this information for you, now we can have just a really, really short break, only five minutes, maybe you don't nearly even have to leave the room. So let's be back here in five minutes because I'm sure it's going to be of much interest to all of you. Thanks.